Hello, I lied. Good morning or afternoon, everybody. How are you today? Thank you for joining us for our third episode of Bar Read Repeat Live, where we get to talk to our library patrons about all of the fun upcoming books that we have or books that we have in our backlist that we want to talk about. Um, we're so glad you joined us this afternoon, and we hope that you will um, be encouraged and excited about the titles that we've selected for this week um, or for this episode. And if you have any questions, we do have our wonderful colleague, Chelsea, uh, in uh, attending the, uh, the Q&A box. So feel free to ask any questions. And I hope you enjoy what we talk about. So thanks again for joining us. And just to um, remind you, I'm Kelly Coyle Corvelli. And I'm Wayne Meekins. And I'm Jen Childs. Uh, we just want to remind you, we know that you probably already know this, but um, for all of the um, all of the books will have little um, letters underneath it that will tell you what uh, what format you can find the um, the books in. So if you are interested in the hardcover edition or the true paper, uh, large print, or the audio book, um, you'll see what book what formats each book is available in um, underneath every title. We just wanted to remind you what that meant, and also we wanted to encourage you to. Um, you know, join us on Twitter, join the conversation, and if you use hashtag BRR Live, we can see your comments and we can get back to you on Twitter as well. And so some of you may already be familiar with our blogs on barreadrepeat.com where you can find reading recommendations and downloadable materials. Uh, we recently posted a Dog Days of Summer blog with a list of great books about dogs, so who doesn't love that? And another blog for hosting summer dinner parties, which is really cool. It's got a list of cookbook recommendations for your appetizers, your salads, your entrees, and desserts, so it's your one-stop shop. Uh, we post a couple of times a week, so there's definitely something for everyone. And of course, you can follow us on socials. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And again, uh, you may be familiar, but if you are not signed up, you can sign up for our bi-weekly e-newsletter at tinyurl.com backslash BRR sign up. Great, and if you can't get enough of virtual events, Penguin Random House has something for you. The Book Your Summer Live, it's a two-day event which has uh, tons of virtual author appearances, giveaways, et cetera. Um, you'll see the URL on your screen, uh, bookyoursummerlive.com, where you can RSVP, and that way you'll be sure to uh, get all the updated correspondence so you don't miss a virtual author event. And now on to the book picks. I'll just say a quick word before we start that we really focus this BRR uh, live event on book club picks. So we're going to talk about um, a lot of fall books that we think would be ideal for book clubs, whether in person or virtual. I know uh, many of you have really um, been creative in figuring out how you can stay together and talk books with your book club. Um, and we have books for just about every audience. So we're going to start with fiction book club picks, um, which um, I'll begin with a Transcendent Kingdom. This is Yaa Jessie's stunning follow-up to her acclaimed national bestseller, Homegoing, Homegoing which if you haven't read, it's an amazing book. Uh, this is a powerful, raw, intimate, deeply layered novel about a Ghanaian family in Alabama. Gifty is a six year PhD candidate in neuroscience at the Stanford University School of Medicine. She's determined to discover the scientific basis for the suffering and addiction that she sees all around her. But even as she turns to the hard sciences to unlock the mystery of her family's losses, she finds herself hungering for her childhood faith and grappling with the evangelical church in which she was raised, whose promise of salvation remains as tantalizing as it is elusive. A Publishers Weekly Starred Review said of Transcendent Kingdom, meticulous, psychologically complex, at once a vivid uh, evocation of the immigrant experience and a sharp delineation of an individual's inner strength, the novel brilliantly succeeds on both counts. And I'm sure you've all heard of a little best-selling author named Jodi Picot. Uh, this is The Book of Two Ways. It's her latest novel about the choices that change the course of our lives. 
It's about Don Edelstein, who's on a plane when the flight attendant makes an announcement to prepare for a crash landing. So she braces herself, and as thoughts flash through her mind, the shocking thing is, is that the thoughts are not of her husband, but of a man that she saw 15 years ago, Wyatt Armstrong, who's an old flame that lives in Egypt working as an archaeologist, like she once hoped to be. So she miraculously survives the crash, but then so do all of the doubts now that have suddenly been raised in her mind. And after the crash landing, when the airline offers transportation to wherever they want to go, the obvious destination is to go home, but she could take another path, which is to go to that archaeological site where she left years before and reconnect with Wyatt and maybe even complete her research on the Book of Two Ways, a project she's been working on. So as the story unfolds, Dawn must confront the questions she's never truly asked, like, what does a life well-lived look like? When we leave this earth, what do we leave behind? Do we make choices or do choices make us? And who would you be if you hadn't turned out to be the person that you are right now? So some pretty heavy questions are raised. And as with Picot's thought-provoking works, this book is going to be perfect for book clubs. I will say that the one time we met Jody Picot, the first time I ever met Jody Picot, I was secretly annoyed that she was actually the most happy-go-lucky person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and her books have caused me like sleepless nights and anxiety. Trauma. <laughs> you know, she's like this, like totally laid back. <laughs> so, um, she's the best. To talk about, yeah. Uh, Mexican Gothic. Um, I'm excited to talk about this book. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the buzz. Uh, I know on Goodreads, everyone's talking about this book, and it's a um, and I can see why. Um, starting with the, you know, we're not supposed to love something because of the cover, but how can you not love the cover? Um, it's, it's a good cover. Isn't it? It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so the New York Times best-selling book, um, an isolated mansion, a chillingly charismatic aristocrat and a brave socialite drawn to expose their treacherous secrets. How can you not love that uh, description? Um, from the author of Gods of Jade and Shadow comes a terrifying twist on a classic Gothic horror. That's from Kirkus Reviews, uh, set in a glamorous 1950s Mexico. Um, and The Guardian, I love the description from The Guardian, especially since I am at this part of the book right now and I'm nervous about what's gonna come next. The Guardian says it's Lovecraft meets the Brontes in Latin America, and oh. after a slow burn, <laughs> Mexican Gothic gets serious and weird. And I think wow. I'm at the precipice of the weird, and I'm not sure where it's going to go. But after receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin, begging for someone to save her from a mysterious doom, Naomi Tabato heads to High Place, a distant house in the, country, in the Mexican countryside. She's not sure what she will find there. Her cousin's handsome, husband, an Englishman, is a stranger, and Naomi knows very little about the region and about him. She's also an unlikely rescuer. She's a glorious, uh, a glamorous debutante, and her chic gowns and perfect red lipstick are more suited for cocktail parties than amateur sleuthing. But she's also tough and smart, with an indomitable will, and she is not afraid. Not of her cousin's new husband, who is both menacing and alluring, not of his father, the ancient patriarch who seems to be fascinated by Naomi, and not even of the house itself, which begins to invade Naomi's dreams with visions of blood and doom. I love books where the atmosphere is as creepy as the people. Um, yeah. Right? Her only ally uh, in the um, inhospitable abode is the family's youngest son. Shy and gentle, he seems to want to help Naomi, but might also be hiding dark knowledge of the family's past. For there are many secrets behind the walls of High Place, the family's once colossal wealth and faded mining empire kept them from prying eyes. But as Naomi digs deeper, she unearths stories of violence and madness. And Naomi, mesmerized by the terrifying yet seductive world of High Place, may soon find it impossible to ever leave this um, house behind. Um, I will just tell you that Entertainment Weekly calls it a period thriller as rich in suspense as it is in lush 50s atmosphere. Really fun. And I will also tell you that we the book club kit has um, paper dolls in it, so it's an even more fun reason to pick this for your book club. I'm actually, I'm, my vacation starts tomorrow, and this is my first read for my vacation. I'm very excited about it. 
Yeah, um, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm going to regret it because I feel like I'm going to get scared. <laughs> really, I don't, really no, keep going, keep going. Um, and now me again. So uh, moving on, I wanted to talk to you about 50 Words for Rain. I'm very excited about this. It's a debut novel from Asha Lemmy, and it's a culturally rich work of historical fiction that's perfect for readers of Pachinko and The Piano Teacher. It's sweeping, heart-rending. It's a coming-of-age novel about a young woman's quest for acceptance in post-World War II Japan. It starts in Kyoto, Japan, 1948, where eight-year-old Nori is taught that if a woman knows nothing else, she should know how to be silent. Do not question, do not fight, do not resist. And that's how this epic starts. And it has an unforgettable and resilient female lead about the ties that bind, the ties that give you strength, and what it means to break free. And Nori, the uh, main character who's battling for freedom is definitely going to be unforgettable. She is strong, she is fierce, and she is going to be loved by book clubs. Um, I saw one of your comments. Um, thank you, uh, whoever wrote it, that it said that Fiona Davis was talking really highly about this book on a podcast last night. Oh, uh, um, love Fiona. We love Fiona too. <laughs> Uh, next up, uh, Shara Me and Major Whittlesley is a heart-tugging and gorgeously written historical novel based on the incredible true story of a World War I messenger pigeon and the soldiers whose lives she forever altered. It's a tragic yet life-affirming war story that the world has never heard. Inspired by true events of World War I, Kathleen Rui res resurrects two long-forgotten yet unforgettable figures recounting their tale in a pair of voices that will change the way that readers look at animals, freedom, and even history itself. A Booklist starred review said, imaginative and audacious, Rooney uses Cherami's bird's eye view and curious afterlife to exhilarating comic and terrifying effect. While Wit's tragic fate is exquisitely rendered, unforgettable, a celebration, sorry, my phone's ringing, a celebration, um, of animal intelligence and tribute to altruism and courage. Um, I loved her first book, so I'm sure this one is going to be just as um, heartfelt. She's really good at writing characters. Um, I'm talking about Farewell Ghosts, another striking cover. I'm really excited to talk about this book because it's from one of our smaller presses that we um, distribute. And um, it's for the fans of the Neapolitan Quartet from um, Elena, Elena Ferrante, which as a lot of you know, was like book club fodder for years. Um, and it's from the same, um, the translator of this book is the same translator as the Neapolitan series. So this is going to be a perfect book club book. Um, and I know a lot of people after the Elena Ferrante series were looking for something else to really dig into um, the complexities and all that. And um, so it's, Perfect for people that are missing that kind of book. Um, this was a finalist uh, for a lot of prizes in Italy and one of the best um, and voted one of the best, 10 best Italian books of 2018. It's about Ida, who is a married woman in her late 30s who lives in Rome and works at a radio station. Her mother wants to renovate the family apartment in Messina to put it up for sale and asks her daughter to sort through her things to decide what to keep and what she wants to throw away. Surrounded by the objects of her past, Ida is forced to deal with the trauma she experienced as a girl, 23 years earlier when her father left one morning never to return. Um, the fierce silences between the mother and the daughter, the unbalanced friendships that leave her emotionally drained, the sense of an identity based on an, on an anom anomaly, sorry, uh, even the relationship with her husband. Everything revolves around the figure of her absent father. Um, Mirroring herself in that absence, Ida has grown up into a woman dominated by fear, suspicious of any form of desire. Uh, however, as, a ch as her childhood home besieges her with its ghosts, Ida will have to find a way to break the spiral and let go of her father finally. Um, beautifully translated, like I said, by the same person who translated uh, the Neapolitan Quartet. Um, it's a poetic, intimate novel about what it means to build one, one's own identity. So, so much to talk about in this book. 
And we know that sometimes there is nothing better than a good nonfiction book club pick. So here we have a few of our recommendations. And I'll start with The Beauty and the Breaking by Michelle Harper. This is a memoir that's perfect for readers of Kelly Corrigan, Brian Stevenson, and Brene Brown. Michelle Harper is a female African-American emergency room physician in a profession that's overwhelmingly male and white. And in this memoir, she talks about not only the struggles she's faced in that field, um, but about how a life of service and servicing others has taught her how to heal herself. So each of the patients Harper writes about has taught her something important about recuperation and recovery or about how to let go of fear when the future is murky. Uh, she's learned how to tell the truth when it's easier to overlook it and how to understand that compassion isn't the same as justice. This is a hopeful, moving, and beautiful book, and she passes along the very precious and necessary lessons that she's learned as a daughter a woman and a physician. So there's a lot to unpack here for book clubs, but I think more importantly uh, for right now, it's really just an inspirational and hopeful read that I think we could all use. Uh, and next up from the best-selling author of Lawrence in Arabia is The Quiet Americans. Uh, this is a gripping history of the early years of the Cold War, the CIA's covert battles against communism and the tragic consequences which still affect America and the world today. In The Quiet Americans, um, the, the book chronicled the exploits of four spies. Michael Burke, a charming fo fallen, uh, former football star fallen on hard times, Frank Wisner, the scion of a wealthy Southern family, and Peter Sickle, a sophisticated German Jew who escaped the Nazis, and finally Edward Lansdell, a brilliant ad executive. The four ran covert operations across the globe, trying to outwit the ruthless KGB in Berlin, parachuting commandos into Eastern Europe, plotting coups and directing wars against communist insurgents in Asia. The intertwined lives of these men began in a common purpose of defending freedom, but the ravages of the Cold War led them to very different fates. Two would quit the CIA in despair, stricken by the moral compromises that they had to make, one became the archetype of the duplicitous and destructive American spy, and one would be so heartbroken that he would take his own life. Um, and to find out who was whom, you'll have to read the book. Uh, a Publishers Weekly starred review said, laced with vivid character sketches and vital insights into 20th century geopolitics, the standout chronicle helps to make sense of the world today. Um, I'm very happy to talk to you next about Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, which um, was an Oprah book, the newest book club pick from Oprah, um, and it's from the Pulitzer Prize winning best-selling author of The Warmth of Other Suns. So I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about this book already, but we just want to make sure you know about it. Um, uh, it, it examines the unspoken caste system that has shaped America and shows how our lives today are still defined by a hierarchy of human divisions. Um, one of the excerpts from the book uh, is very riveting, and it says, as we go about our daily lives, caste is the wordless usher in a darkened theater, flashlight cast down in the aisle, guiding us to our assigned seats for a performance. The hierarchy of caste is not about feelings or morality. It is about power, which groups have it and which books do not. Beyond race, class, or other factors, there is a powerful caste system that influences people's lives and behavior and the nation state. Uh, linking the caste systems of America, India, and Nazi Germany, Wilkerson explores eight pillars that underlie caste systems across civilizations, including divine will, bloodline, stigma, and more. And how she does this is she uses riveting stories about real people, including Martin Luther King Jr., baseball Satchel Paige, a single father and his toddler son, Wilkerson herself, and many others. She shows the ways that the insidious undertow of caste is experienced every day. She documents how the Nazis study the um, racial systems in America to plan out uh, to plan their outcast of the Jews. She discusses why the cruel logic of caste requires that there be a bottom rung for those in the middle to measure themselves against. She writes about the surprising health costs of caste in depression and life expectancy, 
and the effects of this hierarchy on our own culture and policies. Um, finally, she points forward to ways America can move beyond the artificial and destructive separations of human divisions toward hope in our common humanity. Uh, so this book will give you a lot to talk about and discuss in your book club. Uh, it is beautifully written, original and revealing, and a re-examination of what lies under the surface of ordinary life and Americans today. Um, it's, it sounds incredible. Um, sorry, I'm just I'm still thinking about the excerpt that you just read and from that. that. Is like, <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't heard that before you just did it, and I was like, wow, that's incredible. Um, so anyway, <laughs> moving on, um, we're going to talk about Hell in the Heartland by Jax Miller. Uh, this is Stranger Than Fiction. It's page-turning true crime for fans of Breaking Bad and Making a Murderer. It's about a cold case from rural Oklahoma that has stumped authorities for nearly two decades concerning the disappearance of two teenage girls and a much larger mystery. On December 30th, 1999, 16-year-old Ashley Freeman and her best friend, Loria Bible, were having a sleepover. And the next morning, the Freeman family trailer was in flames and both girls were missing. So while rumors of drug debts or revenge and police collusion abounded in the years that followed, the case remained unsolved and the girls were never found. In 2015, crime writer Jax Miller decided to travel to Oklahoma to find out what really happened on that night in 1999, and what follows in Hell in the Heartland is more than she ever bargained for. Jaw-dropping levels of police negligence and corruption, entire communities ravaged by methamphetamine addiction, and a series of interconnected murders with an ominously familiar pattern. So you'll have to read it to find out more, but this is action-packed true crime that I think book clubs will love. Great. We're just trying to stress you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, Brittany K. Barnett was only a law student when she came across the case that would change her life forever. That of Sharonda Jones, single mother, business owner, and like Brittany, black daughter of the rural South. A victim of America's devastating war on drugs, Sharonda had been torn away from her young daughter and was serving a life sentence without parole for a first time drug offense. In Sharonda, Brittany saw haunting echoes of her own life, both as the daughter of a formerly incarcerated mother and as the once girlfriend of an abusive drug dealer. As she studied this case, a system came into focus one where widespread racial injustices forms the core of America's addiction to incarceration. Moved by Sharonda's plight, Brittany set to work to gain her freedom. A Knock at Midnight is Brittany's riveting memoir, at once a coming of age story and a powerful evocation of what it takes to bring hope and justice to a system built to resist them both. Publishers Weekly in a starred review said, an engrossing legal drama complete with wrenching reversals and redemptions. This account richly humanizes defendants while incisively analyzing deep flaws in America's justice system. And this is obviously something that's uh, in the news and um, in the zeitgeist. And I think this will have some uh, you know, very deep conversations with your book club. Um, we picked this last book from Pima Chodron, um, Welcoming the Unwelcome, because I think the title itself is kind of the theme of 2020. I mean, none of us have, <laughs> none of us. Do we have to know, welcome it? <laughs> like, it should be the slogan of the year. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't have a choice and things get rough when you're at least expecting them to. And, you know, how do you handle a crisis or how do you handle life when things get out of control or, um, you know, beyond your control and also without losing your like compassion and your ability to relate with people. Um, so from the best uh, selling author of uh, When Things Fall Apart, this is an open hearted call for human connection, compassion and learning to love the world just as it is during these most challenging times which I really think everybody could use a little bit of that right now. Hey, um, I'll say. 
I know. I have, I have three teenage sons, um, which, by the way, while this webinar has been going on, have been stealing money out of my purse. <laughs> 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 Welcome the unwelcome, Kelly. <laughs> wow. I can't, do, I can't yell at them. None of them. Opportunist. <laughs> But I will say that we had this conversation last night about, um, you know, being able to handle things even when they're not, even when you're not expecting to have to handle them. So that's what un Welcoming the Unwelcome is about. And it's um, her first book of spiritual teachings in over seven years. And Pima Chodron offers a combination of wisdom, heartfelt reflections, and the signature mix of humor and insight that have made her a beloved figure to turn to during times of change. Um, in an increasingly polarized world, Pima shows us how to strengthen our abilities to find common ground, even when we disagree, and, our, and influence our environment in positive ways. Sharing never before told stories from her remarkable life, simple and powerful everyday practices, and directly relatable advice, Pima encourages us all to become triumphant, um, compassionate beings in times of hardship, um, which is honestly what I was just talking to my kids about last night. Um, <laughs> Welcoming the unwelcome includes teachings on the true meaning of karma, recognizing the basic goodness in ourselves and the people we share our lives with. Uh, so I think that this is a book that um, would be a really great conversation to have with the book club right now. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, uh, this is me too, sorry. So while well, speaking of my children, uh, read together book club picks. We know that this is a time where families are having a lot more time together than they have had in the past. They're, they're reading together. They're talking about what's going on in the world together more now than probably ever before or in a really long time. Um, so we know that, that their national conversations are out there. So we wanted to give you some books that you could read um, with your families with that have um, adult versions and young adult versions. So maybe your kids aren't ready for the adult versions yet, but there are the, there is the companion book available as well. So we just want to give you a couple of um, suggestions. Um, the first one is um, not brand new, but if you if you don't know about it, it's from Trevor Noah, and it's um, <clears throat> Born a Crime. So in this book, it's the compelling and inspiring and and comically sublime uh, New York Times bestseller about one man's coming of age set during the twilight of apartheid and the tumultuous days of freedom that followed. Trevor's Trevor Noah's unlikely path from apart apartheid. South Africa to the desk of The Daily Show began with a criminal act, his birth. He was born to a white Swiss father and a black mother at a time when such a union was punishable by five years in prison. Living proof of his parents' indiscretion, Trevor was kept mostly indoors for the earliest years of his life. Bound by the extreme and often absurd measures his mother took him, uh, took to hide him from the government that she could at any moment um, steal him away and how terrifying would that be? Um, finally liberated by the end of South Africa's tyrannical white rule, Trevor and his mother set forth on a grand adventure, living openly and freely and embracing the opportunities won by a centuries long struggle. So Born a Crime is the story of a mischievous young boy who grows into a restless young man as he struggles to find himself in a world where he was never supposed to exist. It's filled with personal essays, very funny stories, um, what happened, attempts at kidnapping, all sorts of things. Um, but there's also a sense of humor. And um, the two things I think you get the most out of this book is the is the underlying sense of humor and, and optimism and also the mother's unconventional and, uh, and unconditional love. So this certainly would be a great uh, conversation to have with your family. And next up is Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, where we also have the adult version and a young adult adaptation. I'd be very surprised if you hadn't heard of Just Mercy. It was a number one New York Times bestseller. It's now a major motion picture starring Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx. It was named one of the most influential books of the decade by CNN, one of the best, best books of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Seattle Times, Esquire, and Time. It won the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction, um, winner of the NAACP Image Award for Nonfiction, uh, finalist for the Kirkus Reviews Prize, and it was an American Library Association notable book. But if you haven't managed, to, that's it. <laughs> if you haven't managed to hear Just Mercy, um, 
It's the story of Brian Stevenson. Um, he was a young lawyer when he founded the Equal Justice Initiative, a legal practice dedicated to defending those most desperate and in need, the poor, the wrongly condemned, and women and children trapped in the farthest reaches of our criminal justice system. One of his first cases was that of Walter McMillan, a young man who was sentenced to die for a notorious murder he insisted he didn't commit. The case drew Brian into a tangle of conspiracy, political machination, and legal brinkmanship and transformed his understanding of mercy and justice forever. Just Mercy is at once an unforgettable account of an idealistic, gifted young lawyer's coming of age, a moving window into the lives of those he's defended, and an inspiring argument for compassion in the pursuit of true justice. I think it's a great opportunity to read these books with your family and then watch the movie. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's true. They did, yeah. a great, they did a great job with the movie. It was, even though you know exactly what's going to happen, it still gets you. Yeah. Um, and the other Wes Moore uh, by Wes Moore also has a great young adult companion book called Discovering Wes Moore so that this story can be shared with your kids or teen book clubs. And it's the fascinating story of two fatherless boys from Baltimore, both named Wes Moore. One is in prison serving a life sentence for murder, and the other is a Rhodes Scholar, an Army vet, and the author of this book. It starts when the author writes a letter to the other Wes Moore in prison, not expecting to receive a, re a reply, but a reply comes, the friendship grows, and letters turn into visits, and the two men get to know each other, and eventually that friendship has become the inspiration for this book. So in Discovering Wes Moore, the young adult adaptation, uh, it's a great read to share that teaches a cautionary tale examining the factors that contribute to success and failure and the choices that make all the difference. Um, also, this is being turned into a movie produced by Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, so another one that you can read and then you know watch as a family. Uh, it'll have a lot of commercial appeal and great for younger book clubs. Great. And um, kind of one of the books of the moment now is How to Be an Anti-Racist uh, by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, he's the National Book Award winning author of Stamp from the Beginning. And here he brings us a groundbreaking approach to understanding and uprooting racism and inequality in our society and in ourselves. This was named one of the best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review, Time, NPR, The Washington Post, Shelf Awareness, Library Journal, PW, and Kirkus Reviews. Uh, I'll share with you what NPR says about this book because I think it kind of sums it up. Um, Ibram X. Kendi's new book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, couldn't come at a better time. Kendi has gifted us with a book that is not only an essential instruction manual, but also a memoir of the author's own path from anti-black racism to anti-white racism and finally to anti-racism. How to Be an Anti-Racist gives us a clear and compelling way to approach, as Kendi puts it in his introduction, the basic struggle we're all in, the struggle to be fully human and see that others are fully human. And it's never too early to start this discussion. Um, we have a companion book called Anti-Racist Baby, both in board um, and a picture book, with bold art and thoughtful yet playful text Anti-Racist Baby introduces the youngest readers, as well as the grown-ups in their lives, to the concept and power of anti-racism, providing the language necessary to begin critical conversations at the earliest age. Anti-Racist Baby is the perfect gift for readers of all ages dedicated to forming a just society. And if you haven't already read The Woman's Hour by Elaine Weiss, which I highly recommend, uh, you definitely should. And now they have adapted it for young readers as well. And especially for right now with the 100 year anniversary of the adoption of the 19th Amendment, 
giving women the right to vote approaching, this is timely and essential for both adults and kids. Uh, in the Women's Hour, Weiss writes about activism, civil rights, and the fight for women's suffrage. It takes place in August 1920 when American women are so close to winning the right to vote that they've been fighting for for more than 70 years. They just need approval from one more state. But suffragists faced opposition from every side, and it becomes a fight over politics and a debate over the role of women and girls in society and whether or not they should be considered equal to men and boys. Um, so really, this is a must read for everyone, and it's great that they have this for kids, too. Um, I know a lot of us have talked to our, um, you know, when you were a student or when you're growing up or when you talk to your kids and you say, you know, what do you want to do with your life? Everyone is always thinking big, like, what do you want to do with your life? Man's search for meaning is um, kind of the opposite of that. So um, we need to stop talking. We need to stop asking about the meaning of life. Instead, to think of ourselves as those who are being questioned by life daily and hourly. Our answer must consist not in talk and meditation, but in right action and in right conduct. Life ultimately means taking the responsibility to find the right answer to its problems and to, fill, to fulfill the task which it constantly sets for each individual. When Man's Search for Meaning was first published in 1959, it was hailed by Carl Rogers as one of the outstanding contributions to psychological thought in the last 50 years. Now, more than 40 years and 4 million copies later, this tribute to hope in the face of unimaginable loss has emerged as a true classic. Man's Search for Meaning, at once a memoir, a self-help book, and a psychological manual, is the story of a psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl's struggle for survival during his three years in Auschwitz and other Nazi concentration camps. Yet, rather than a quote-unquote tale concerned with great horrors, Franklin focuses in on the hard fight for existence waged by the great army of unknown and, unre and the unrecorded. Victor Frankl's training as a psychiatrist allowed him a remarkable perspective on the psychology of survival. In these inspired pages, he inserts that the will to meaning is the basic motivation for human life. This simple and yet profound statement became the basis of his psychological theory and forever changed the way he understood our humanity in the face of suffering. As Nietzsche put it, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Um, ooh, that makes me want to cry. Frankel's seminal work <laughs> offers us <laughs> all an avenue to greater meaning and purpose in our own lives, a way to transcend suffering and find significance in the act of living. Uh, the young adult edition makes this um, more um, relatable to kids. It has um, some photo inserts, a glossary of terms, a chronicle of Frankel's life with some supplementary letters and speeches, making it um, perfect for a family um, talking about the Holocaust or, you know, those struggles of life and the, and the, the uh, importance of survival. And I'm sure you've seen that this week was very big for a celebrity book club picks. They all came out at once. Um, here are the uh, five that we have, um, and you can also go on to barreadrepeat.com, and we have a running list of the complete um, picks for Reese, Oprah, and Jenna Bush Hagar. We also, like I mentioned before, with Mexican Gothic having the um, paper dolls for the book club kits, in the book club kit, we have a lot of um, really fun book club kits um, overall in our um, in our collection, if you go onto our issue page, um, The Starless Sea, Untamed, Glennon Doyle's Untamed, um, all sorts of things that will make your um, book club more fun, more engaging, more, um, you know, different and unique. We have a lot of drink recipes. So if you're drinking this book, you should make this drink. So we make it a lot of fun. The, the, uh, the books are fun themselves and it's, these kits will really enhance your reading experience. And then um, we also have quite a few resources um, for book clubs. We hope you found titles that appealed to you today that we presented, but if not, not to worry, we have plenty more. If you um, 
go to our issue page, you can view our most recent book club brochure, as well as our Celebrate Diverse Voices uh, brochure. Uh, the book club brochure has sample discussion questions, uh, Spanish language picks, um, books for young uh, young readers. Uh, so we've we've heard that it's quite a valuable resource for planning future book club uh, picks. We also do have um, some printed copies, um, and uh, if you follow the tiny URL, um, it's tinyurl.com backslash prh book clubs 2020. Uh, you'll find a Google Doc where you can request printed copies, and we'll be happy to mail that to you. Um, also, can you go back, um, Kelly? Someone asked about the Celebrity Book Club. It, it's me. Oh, Marty. Yes, I saw. Um, yes, so there these are go. the Celebrity Book Clubs. And we will be sending out a wrap-up uh, with, you know, um, the recap for this so that you can see everything later. But these are the, the five from this week. Um, and then I'll also mention another great uh, fun resource is our digital um, summer reading sampler, uh, which you can download to your device. Um, this has excerpts of some of our top summer reads, um, so you can um, get a sneak peek, decide what you want to, uh, you can dip into a few things and decide what you want to commit to. Uh, we also have some fun um, recipes included in the sampler. So please, this is great for librarians, but also for uh, readers. So if you are a librarian um, listening to us today, please do feel free to share this out to your patrons. Uh, it's just a great resource for planning uh, what to read next. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because and you that's it. Time. <laughs> yeah, we and, and we will um, be sending out info. We don't have our next live event scheduled, but uh, never fear. We have your info, and we will be um, blasting out that information so you won't miss it. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>